Hello team. Uh, this is JJ. Give it a few more minutes. Uh, one more minute for late comers to join and then we'll get this started. And in the meantime, uh, people who have joined, if you want to check in in the doc uh, with your name, please do. Also, any volunteers for scribe, scribing today's meeting? Highly appreciated. Who's running our meeting today? Are we waiting for the moderator? Uh, no, I just wanted to give a few minutes for people to add their name ah. uh, so that I can call out their name and sure. harass them with an update. Yeah, so <laughs> you, do you want only people that have something to say to put their name in there? Or should we say uh, no update in there? Yeah, no update's probably fine. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, but I think yeah, that you don't have to walk around the, the room and yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm yeah, also doing the in the chat. Yeah. Thank you. I'm also doing the MIMD thing because my Wi-Fi at home is not good. So I'm using laptop for no for dock and phone for the call. So, all right. So, as people add their name, let's get uh, let's get started on chicken. Um, Emily, Emily Fox. Hello, it's Emily. Hello. Um, so, lots of great things have happened over the past week. Um, we got all the CFPs reviewed, we got an agenda put together, it's been put out, all the attendees have um, accepted, and we have great sponsors, which means that we've got lunch and happy hour, so lots of great things for Security Day. Yep, thank you. Yay! Yes. Yep. It's a, it's a happy half hour as I hear, so... Oh, we don't have two scribes. I'll um, I can be can, scribe as long as somebody else can do it while because uh, I'm also going to talk about the OPA assessment. So we do need somebody else who's willing to type. Yes. Can someone volunteer for Skype, please? I'll try to cover in for Stripe. Um, so I don't, uh, next is me, so I'll just give my update. Uh, I don't have much of an update uh, 
update yet. Uh, we, uh, I'm working with uh, Harvard to see if we could actually pull in all the policy documents that are uh, lying around and then into the SIG security repo so that it will be easier to track and uh, discover. Um, SIG security, Day, Emily Fox gave an update on that. And, uh, uh, We'll be, Sarah, Dan, and I will be meeting up with uh, uh, with Joan Liz on uh, 30th, and we'll uh, circle back with the team with any updates from there. Daniel, do you want to go next? Yes. So, uh, unfortunately, for the last couple of weeks, I couldn't attend the meetings. Now I'm, uh, I'm fully back, and I saw that... Uh, uh, Falco assessment kicked in, so I, need, I will need to catch up with this since I was one of the volunteers that um, wanted to, to do it. So, yeah, ca catching up for me. Great, okay. and I think there's a um, issue open now that um, Robert opened, so if I'll try to put it in the notes. Um, but yeah, that would be great for you to you know chime in on the issue and make sure that you're on the list of volunteers. Perfect, thank you. There it is, I found it. Yeah, if you can link that to the... Yeah, I'll stick it in the notes. Thanks. Amy, do you wanna go next? As I come off of mute, um, yeah, we've got a lot of work oh. for the SIG security uh, day at KubeCon. Um, and one other note, we will need someone to be able to do an update at our next POC meeting on the first. So taking volunteers for that. Oh, these are the updates point. for um, the TOC about like what are the SIGs doing, like all the things. Mm -hmm. so. Um, so yeah, so JJ did that last time. We wanted to iterate on the format a bit to um, make sure that like have a little more lead time. So thanks for mentioning it, Amy. Absolutely. Um, I mentioned it. I was able to go to the policy team meeting in the afternoon last week and mentioned it to um, Howard and um, and team and Erica are um, the the leads of that team. So we're it would be great if we could try to get that PR done. I'm mostly talking to JJ because Howard's on. Yeah. Not yeah. available this time zone. Um, I but if, if we can get that PR closed, I, I give much feedback. Um, then that would be sweet to link to. It's really formalizing what's been going on for a really long time, um, but it's nice to surface that I think, and that group's been doing some great stuff. Um, so um, I think that I'm available. Oh no, I'm not. It's IIW next week. Oh, no. So I can help with the slide, JJ, in terms of iterating on the content, but I can't present. I'll take it. I'll take. Uh, I'll do the presentation. I'll work with Sarah and Howard on uh, getting the content on the slide. Uh, so I'll take the AI on that. Great. Thanks. Thanks for bringing it up, Amy. Yeah, Thank you much. Um. Am I up, JJ? Should I just? Yep. Yep, yep Sarah. Back? Go for it. You're already on it. Yeah. Um, so I've um, I mentioned the, the the syncing up with the policy group. I also had um, I've been catching in advance of IIW, which is October first through third. If anybody's local, um, I would highly recommend that. It's an unconference focused on identity that's been happening for thirty years. Like the OAuth standard came out of work at that group to, you know, get everybody to stop sharing names and passwords. And um, they're doing a lot of really interesting, uh, the last couple have um, really, a lot of people are focusing on self-sovereign identity, which is um, pretty interesting to track. So catching up on reading, I um, dove into verified credentials, which are a new W, relatively new W3C standard that is emerging. And Howard actually chimed in on Twitter and asked if that would be relevant for the group. So since I'm learning about it, um, I, I thought I would ask other people here. We can talk about it later, but just kind of want to put it out there that I'd be 
up for seeing if I could get somebody from that effort to present to the group if people thought it was relevant and interesting. Um, and, uh, and then my other update is also on the agenda, which is I've been helping contribute to the OPA assessment. And JJ's asked me to talk about it a bit today. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, if you can post the IAW link on the... Uh, it's in the agenda. Uh, chat. Oh, perfect, okay. So I just stuck it in, announce, FYI. Sounds good, so, yeah. Um, so, uh, what's this, who's next? Christian Kemper, no updates. Ray has no updates. TK has no updates. Roger has no updates. Uh, but if anyone wants to chime in or chat on anything that, uh, that's been mentioned, please feel free to. Otherwise, people that have not added their names that have anything else that they want to talk about, uh, please do. I do see few I people. do have a question, yeah. um, and I, I don't remember seeing it in any of the guides or docs that we have. As the SIG security work uh, group is working on assessments and evaluations of projects, and those documents are in draft but available to the group, what is the standard practice for using the information within those draft documents? Uh, that's a good question, Colin user one. It's Emily, by the way. <laughs> Emily, I know. <laughs> so, like, I had, I, I had I to can, say that. <laughs> so, what exactly yeah. are you, is the question? So, so uh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. For so, for when when Six Security is doing a draft, is doing an assessment of a particular project, um, and we have the draft and all of our. Um, recommendations and commentary and updates that we're posting through the git flow is publicly available anybody can really go in and see the prs they can see all the comments they can see the dialogue that's going back and forth but i don't know that we've officially documented not, at least not that i can see what the expected use of those draft documents are or if there's a caveat on them or a disclaimer that all the information contained within this pr is draft until officially posted and made available on x site I, di I didn't know if that was something we should be discussing, concerned with, take advantage of. Like, how, what is the expected use for SIG security members or people outside of SIG security when viewing the contents of draft unofficially published documentation? I think that's a really good Very question. Very long question. Well, I think <laughs> it's, I actually think um, it's a, it's a, it's a, I think it would be imp important to have a caveat, like, I've just been kind of like, well, it goes without saying that all this stuff is unverified until we all approve it. But if somebody dropped in from, you know, wherever and wasn't aware of it, it could be amplified in a way that would be undesirable or misleading, right? right? And so we get access to interesting information about some of these projects that's not necessarily publicly available until we start interacting with them and actually writing it down and creating a ticket and submitting a PR on it. And like, how do we provide assurances to those organizations with our due diligence ourselves, as well as outside of that, somebody coming across it? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I it might be worth looking should. at actually um, I think we have, um, let me look at, um, if we look at the, let me see if I can get on Zoom and share my screen. Okay, are people seeing this? This is the um, yes. security assessments part of the repo. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we have this sort of like this language of caveating the whole thing, right? That um, it's at least the intent of this description was this is supposed to give you a, a path into thinking about the security of the project, 
not mm -hmm. replace your own process for determining whether it's a fit for you. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's, you know, there's framing the assessment in general, right? We had a lot of discussion early on that we didn't want these assessments to be approved, you know, <laughs> if we don't believe that they're binary. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And that, you know, we've, we've been careful to say, like, just because the project has work to do doesn't mean that's a negative thing. It's, in fact, a positive outcome of the process and so forth and so on. So I think it might be good to, I don't know, reflect on this bit, right, to make sure that we're, you know, looking at this six months after we wrote it, I'm not feeling like it really conveys that aspect, right, the caveat aspect. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is, I don't know where we would put, I think it would be good to have something in here that at least says, if people are reading all the words while things are in draft, they're just an individual's opinion and should not be taken as truth or something like that, which is basically, I think, the, the spirit of the team. Like if somebody asks a question and the project reviewer doesn't have an answer, that doesn't mean that that is unanswered right it doesn't mean right. that the person has raised an issue that's a real issue it could fall out that all that thing was a misunderstanding and that needs to be communicated somehow i think yeah i my like from a disclaimer caveat for people that are coming to the repo and coming across this information i was thinking maybe a line or two in the readme and potentially expanding upon the code of conduct because we are a security focused special interest group that above and beyond the normal humane code of contact caveating in there if you're a member of this group the information that you're going to come across is always in draft and not to be considered actionable or taken and running up the flagpole for instance so something to that effect it, if that's what we want to do I just don't know and I hadn't I was thinking about it earlier today and went looking and didn't see anything beyond specifically what you had cited um, I think would you be up for doing at least an issue, if not a PR that yeah. sort of proposes something. I think that'd be great to add to. And I love the idea of having, because we've, we've, you know, we, we, we've gotten presentations before where people have said, okay, don't tweet about this yet. It's not published. And people right. are generally very respectful of that. And I would love to see that reflected in our code of conduct, right? That there's yeah. like, you know, this two-sided thing. Like, of course, if, you know, people don't engage with us positively, we may publicly document our findings. But until it's officially reported, it's not confirmed or whatever. Right. There, there's I like think, a, can... this is a reporting rigor. I think we have a we all practice, and n newcomers should know that. Okay. okay. I'm working on that issue all right, right now. Uh, all right, sounds good. I just uh, scribed it. Uh, so, if there isn't uh, anyone else who is willing to check in, uh, then we can dive into the OPA. Uh, just for completeness sake, let me ask if there is anybody from, anybody from any other working group, SIGOTH? Cube Sigat or policy working group that anybody has attended that wants to give an update? Nope. Uh, I have uh, one question regarding um, our partnership with other six. Uh, uh, how does it look? Because um, uh, there are some issues in, for example, Signal that uh, security issues uh, that are. Uh, hanging there for proposals that are hanging there for like years and uh, is do we have any way to influence it somehow for example wait so where i didn't uh, i misheard uh, for example i, I found one uh, interesting thing in a sig note uh, there is a proposal for um, for a runtime change and uh, it's there for like two years and i was uh, wondering how uh, it, what is our relationship with uh, Kubernetes SIGs? Uh, if uh, if we can influence something or or change, I don't know. Uh, just want to, to know. 
um, if you can point to the specific issue and talk about it, it will be good. But in, um, the overall stance, okay. yeah, the overall stance on that is uh, essentially uh, Sigath operates on its own. Right. And uh, influencing Sigat is uh, it's not the goal of this group. It's rather to help Sigat in surfacing what the issue is to the rest of the rest of the org and community. Right, that's that's the objective. But uh, if you do want to bring it up uh, into this group and talk about the specifics of it and why you think it should be prioritized, then we can surface that to a wider audience. Yeah, and I think when I, I always come back to our charter and mission, right? So our mission is to reduce the risk that cloud native applications expose end user data or allow other unauthorized access. So if there is an issue, right, in the world, in any of the pro particularly in CNCF projects, because we're part of the CNCF. So if we, if one of our projects is, has an issue that is, we think is risky to cloud native applications in the ecosystem, then I think highlighting our concern, like we have a forum here, right? And we have the ability to, we could invite SIGOC or a project to discuss an issue that we consider to be risky. And we can talk about why we consider it to be risky and what mitigations they know about. And I think that forum creates opportunity for action. Um, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Daniel, oh, if you know okay. of that issue, and yeah. I would create an is uh, issue in our report to uh, bring that issue up and talk about that in this group. Uh, so perfect. The rest of the group. Then I will, I will prepare it. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I think wherever possible, we should like you know we can plan ahead and and like you know invite people from the relevant projects or other SIGs um, to have a discussion. Yep. 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 That's a good idea. Um, Okay, so if anyone else has anything to talk about, uh, if not, then I'd like Sarah to uh, give an update about the OPA review, learnings from that, uh, and uh, for the rest of us to chime in to see. Running ahead of an attack. Yep. It's JJ. So I participated yep. in this security assessment. For those of you who are might not be following the the details here um we're on our second so all of the assessments are tagged under this assessment tag if i remove the is open you can see that we have we're in the we've got three assessments in toto is completed open policy agent we are on the verge of completing and falco we are on the verge of starting so our goal is to have five assessments and then reflect on our process. Of course, if anything's in our way, we can update our process, but we are, you know, we're baby steps here. We're doing our second assessment. <laughs> and then um, we want to talk through our, our learnings, um, but not, you know, deep dive too much in maybe we should do X, Y, or Z. We just capture those. And so we also have another label for the um, assessment process. So I have to uncheck this. So you can see there's a lot of open issues, right? That are like, if you're participating in the assessments or observing them or you know, hearing about them in the meetings and you're like, wow, they should really do X, Y, Z. You can look at everything labeled assessment process, process and this is the time for us to be capturing what um, we're learning or ideas about how to improve the process. And then we'll review all of these issues um, after these first five assessments and um, then um, do some improvements. So that's kind of like the big picture of where we are. Um, if we go back to the, um, this assessment issue, right? So we're here going through this checklist of things and now we have the PR out for the um, assessment summary and we will, Amy, need to schedule a TOC presentation shortly. Um, whenever there's an opening on the calendar and that is totally fine if we can wait until after KubeCon, I would be delighted so um, Touch base with Liz. I think Liz would like it to be not waiting that long 
So the um, reason, the only reason so let's not go into the details of scheduling here. Okay. Um, happy, let's just t chat offline, but just to let you know that we want to make sure that at least Justin and Ash and one of the co-chairs is at that presentation whenever okay. we decide to queue it up. That is totally fine. So, um, so this is the assessment. We, um, OPA, um, some of you may recall, we had a presentation by OPA some time ago. Um, and uh, they presented their, you know, how it works. It's, um, we have a background where basically policy is a big part of security, right? We have a breakout group um, that focuses on policy. Um, and in order to say that you have a secure system, you need to make sure that you actually have some policies and they're being followed. OPA is a project that helps with this by um, having a, um, by making it so that you can write your policies in this Rego language and um, then validating that, like doing the policy enforcement and um, implementing those controls in um, ways that are like, can be machine, you can reason about with machine code. So, um, so that's kind of, I kind of went through the summary, but um, I'll go through this now a little bit in order. We have this maturity section, which is kind of um, a, if we don't quite know how to define it. Um, so with each assessment, we make it up. Um, but we have this idea that as context for how we think about the improvements that we'd like to see, we want to have some indication of how widely used this project is. We don't want to be the arbiters of success, but rather echo that information because it, it affects how, what recommendations we have. If this is very early new technology that's experimental, we might have different recommendations than this is used by almost every you know, service on the internet. So here, what we did was we collected a set of companies that are used by OPA, which you know sort of indicates that um, it's under like quite a bit of use um, and linked to their list of adopters. And then also they're getting con community participation from a wide range of adopters. Um, although, you know, like the noting that they're primarily from Styra because um, there's been a bunch of conversations in the TOC about wanting to um, support open source projects that are primarily one company to have enough participation from the community that that's robust if that company decides to do other things, right? Um, getting to the sustainability. That's a little outside security, but it's a for, course effect. It, it, effect, it affects security because We've seen a large, a, a significant attacks of late that are based on so, something becoming not maintained anymore and nobody paying attention, right? And so, um, so that at least seems important to me. And I think I saw a question in the chat. Oh, no. Um, thanks. So, um, so I kind of went a little bit. Um, over the design. I think the key takeaway from our perspective is that um, if you have heterogeneous infrastructure or a high rate of change where lack of policy enforcement would create a big business risk, that's when the added overhead of implementing OPA would be valuable. So this is a common situation, right, that people have on-prem and cloud or multiple clouds or different way or, di or just different services that all need to have similar or the same policies. And um, whenever you, what we're seeing is in that heterogeneous infrastructure that presents risks because people can't reason about their policies or know that they've been implemented. Um, so, um, and that's sort of common in this cloud way. And so the, the, you know, the, the, added benefit of OPA also presents risks, right? So it's great we have this policy as code expressions that you can, you know, sort of, you can implement the same across heterogeneous systems and separate 
your security code from your application code. But then these are really like they, it requires the same care as code and some, you know, and there's concern that the imp that there will be a false sense of security just because you're using OPA. So um, we, you know, a lot of our discussions were really around how do we, how do you think about this policy language and make sure that it's saying what you want it to say and that people are understanding what they're expressing when they express policy in this language. Um, so, sorry, do we have a feel of who the target persona for OPA is in, in our, in our uh, security personas that we have? This, this looks like it would fall into the um, um, what we call it, platform implement. Is, is that correct? Well, it's so I think we have this in here somewhere. Oh, okay. Good use. Oh, this is their self assessment. Um, we have the goal. Somewhere I thought we had the target user. Um, Mm. Well, we might not. If we can write that in the notes, I want to just double check because I yeah. thought we had that somewhere. But it's a good question. From what, what I remember, um, I think the target I, user is the operator or um, the um, developer, and that you could use OPA. I mean, like Netflix uses OPA, and they're not a platform per se. I mean, I don't know, maybe they have APIs, but it's primarily to secure it. No, no, um, but the platform, there could be people at Netflix that implement the Netflix platform for use of other Netflix engineers, right? Right. So, so not that true. Netflix offers the platform to outside users. That's true. That's sort of an interesting... Um, also, Christian, if you uh, want to go chime in on the... Uh, PR with comments about this, that will be uh, super valuable too. I mean, I'll do that uh, if you don't, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, that'd be fabulous. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. For pointing that out, JJ. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to have everybody in the um, use cases doc, we have these personas that are um, different users are operators, administrators, developers, end users, and platform implementers. And the um, security assessments are supposed to focus who uses this stuff. And so, um, so we should make sure that we um, yeah. covered that. Um, but, uh, but I think that's interesting. There might be opportunity for looking at who's using OPA to find some of those platform implementers you've been looking for, Christian. Yeah, because I know in the Gatekeeper project, they have separated these personas, right? Gatekeeper is one of the OPA uh, uh, sub-projects. Right. And, and they have separated these personas, and I was wondering what the official OPA stands is on that. Okay, thanks. Cool. So, um, so do you do, are people feel like they're familiar enough with OPA? Do you want me to talk through some of the self-assessment to talk about what it does, or shall I go straight into the recommendations? How do you, uh, anyone has any Or maybe we could start with any, uh, any further questions on what um, OPA does. Yeah, anyone wants any basic info about OPA that'll help them understand what the review is about? I would say no, because I think we've talked about OPA. Or why don't you take like a, yeah, it'll be worth the 30 second intro to OPA before we jump in. Um, okay, so, um, so generally it's for controlling access to a service. And um, with the caveat that I am not an OPA person, I've never actually used this technology hands on. So people feel free to correct me. Um, the, uh, this separates the data coming in from the policy. And so general, the data and the policy are combined into um, 
a intermediate document that's evaluated for a decision and one of the um, and so what you're, you're writing this policy in a rego language in this rego language and then your data is expressed in something like JSON and then they're um, com they're evaluated and the decision can be yes no or I don't know so that you can compose these policies together so and then the this um, OPA piece is um, generally deployed as a sidecar, but it, they have some libraries and, and different deployment models. So you can, um, you know, you could bind it into your service or, you know, run it as a sidecar, whatever um, mode you want to run it in. Okay. Any questions? or observations? Yeah, I, I, I do have a uh, comment to a question possibly. Um, with the OPA, I, because from our security, um, since we are the security working group, we are expanding the attack surface, meaning, you know, the OPA itself will be opening up for some vulnerability in being attacked and the policies could be manipulated. And I was wondering if, have you seen anything specific as to what maybe the preventative measures that OPA is taking or recommending? So I think that with the, add the addition of any part of your system, right, your, if you add anything, you're expanding the attack surface, but then you have to think about like, a, is the issues you're mitigating um, bigger, right? Than what you're attacking, what, what you're what you're adding, and so that's part of, of our record, our analysis. Where you shouldn't be, you probably shouldn't be using OPA if you have very very simple policy and a homogeneous system, right? Um, just because it would add more complexity than is merited, was sort of like our analysis. And to answer your question, though, we have. Um, basically we went through this process of kind of articulating what things are risky right and um that if uh, uh, opa is successfully attacked right this is your point of policy access and that is you know pretty risky and so we went through there's actually like a lot of sharp edges around have you set up opa correctly and are you managing your policies effectively? Because OPA isn't a policy management system. So you have to, outside of OPA, figure out how you're going to distribute your policy. That's this gatekeeper project that Christian mentioned. So it's very, um, it is a piece of the puzzle. It is not the solution by itself. And I think that's the key thing that we want to surface so that people understand um, what they're getting when they adopt OPA. So and they, they, go ahead. No, I was just wondering, yeah, that's a good point. I, I kind of assumed that that would be the case. They probably decoupled. I, I wonder if OPA is also giving some recommendation as to for the implementation. So for example, if you have a centralized policy engine for a complex environment, such as what you were alluding to earlier, as far as where OPA could be implemented, uh, multiple clouds, multiple, um, you know, uh, BI or uh, different type of uh, environments that all trying to consolidate the policies so that we have a uniform and consistent policy rather. And when you do that, obviously you are bringing in that in a kind of a brain or some sort of a think um, area or somewhat centralized in some sense. And, uh, and that's becoming even more sensitive to the operation of the whole um, enterprise um, and, and the users. And I wonder, does OPA go into the implementation part of it as far as how to, uh, any recommendation? Is so they actually have pretty comprehensive deployment docs that go through a couple of different models. Mm. And I mean, I think that this gatekeeper project is really about them saying, okay, well, this is a common, like expanding beyond the the agent, right, that evaluates policy to 
the other parts of the ecosystem because there is a need there. Um, but I think those are really good questions. Um, and it really, like, I think that's kind of a good lead in to our recommendations um, where, which like I mentioned, focused mostly around like the potential for confusion um, and the, um, there's sort of an assumption, I think, in this whole project, which, um, which maybe understates your point, TK, which is um, that you, like, you need to manage your policies really well and make sure that that doesn't become, you're not just moving your, your you know, like you, you, where you're being attacked to some place that is less secure. Right. Um, was, yeah. But what we're like, just on a personal note, there seems to be this sort of common pattern in a lot of the exploits I read about, which are that things are not configured. Things are people, things are not configured the way that people think they're going to, they are configured, right? That the systems become so complex. People have so many, VMs and services running that it's easy for something to not be secured at all. And that things end up being wide open on the internet unintentionally. And I think that one of the things that makes me interested in following OPA is, you know, that's the thing that you're mitigating is the sort of, oh, oops, forgot to secure that, right? Forgot to update this, you know, I have to update my policy in 15 places and it's different formats. And now I'm just, you know, it's too easy to make a human error that misses those. So, um, so it might be good to Kate or somebody like, you know, like if in reading the um, overview, like, do we address those points? Yeah, I, yeah, I think it is also called out on the review in terms of what scope of OPA is and what it solves and what it doesn't. And uh, there is some call out there, but uh, it'll be useful to chime in on the uh, PR and add, and add to that as well to say, to be clear on uh, increase in attack surface versus uh, scoping it down to thing and uh, tooling to mitigate some of these. Once we chime in, for example, on this, and are we going to consolidate all our issues at some point and feed it to the OPA people, or how is that? It, it is. Well, so this is uh, the, so all of the OPA. This is this process has led to these okay. writing up or fine or highlighting OPA issues. So mo many of these OPA issues that are in the project recommendations came out of the review, and so it's the review is really owned by there's a self self assessment where Ash is. Um, he's a contributor to OPA and he owns like getting that over the line. Um, and then either he or we report issues into OPA so that this, once this PR is in, there are open issues tracking everything we raised. So if, if we chime in, we're doing sort of two things. One is producing this document, which, which is kind of like anybody's guide into understanding the security profile, the risk profile the benefit of this particular project, but also allowing us to track um, these open issues. And we've been sort of chatting about like writing these issues such that if we, um, there's been talk that we want to um, re-review -re these assess like assessments periodically, like maybe annually, that maybe if a particular project hasn't added a, any features in a year, right? that we could do a cursory review and just look at the issues and do a quick update, right? Whereas if a project has added a bunch of features of related to security, then maybe we would do a full assessment. And so we're trying to like sort of queue this up so it's easy to update if that turns out to be uh, something that we, you know, it's reflected in reality. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's, that's good. Um, um, so at this point, the only code that has been contributed is by Estrella. I uh, know it's um, the contributors are mostly Styra. So there's basically there's a chef. I just looked at these 77 contributors with Ash and, um, you know, kind of like looked through the top contributors 
and I don't remember which of these people it was, but there was somebody in these top four that was from Chef, which seemed to me to be a good sign. And then um, the there's somebody from Google who's pretty far down because it's mostly spec stuff. Here we go. This um, Tristan has worked on um, mostly the Rego 2 spec, which is also kind of like a sign that it's not just Styro, but it does have the vast majority of the contributions are Styra. So overall for the ecosystem, provided this, you know, continues to be adopted, I'd like to see more contributions from other companies, but that's, a, I think it's a process, but they they seem to be making good progress on getting wider contributions. Uh, did, did we have any confrontations on uh, during this assessment in a way that um, um, some findings were uh, conflicting with the idea of OPA or whatever? With, uh, from well, I think uh, co um, confrontation would be too strong a word. <laughs> we had uh, some uh, good discussions around what, as, as, as ha now, this being our second one has become the norm, which is like, where are the edges of OPA's responsibility, right? Particularly around rego usability and around defaults, right? So it's very challenging to make things secure by default because the most secure thing by default is to just turn off access completely and that's not useful. Um, and so how do you make it less likely that somebody is going to do something incorrect because they don't know what they're doing? Um, and how, and so we talked about, you know, really I ended up having a brainstorm because um, the, like, Ash came in with a stance, which I think is, you know, sort of reasonable from their perspective, which is that, well, you know, we're giving you a sharp knife. People need to do these different things. So we can't, and we don't know what your policies are. So what, you know, there's not much to do there other than, in, and, you know, initially all of the project recommendations were turned into documentation improvements, yes. right? So a quick, quick time check. Uh, we have 10 more minutes. Um, and a uh, couple of things. One is uh, if this discussion that you've already had, if it can be captured and put it onto a GitHub or if we have already done it, part of the assessment. So that then... is, I'm talking about 2A here. Okay, okay. So, um, so I'll just wrap this in the next few minutes. Um, uh, no, so all I wanted to note, uh, bring up is like, we only have 10 minutes. If you had more things to cover, then I would uh, offline this and then cover. Otherwise, we can, if this is what you wanted to do, then uh, you're more than, I'm more than happy to. Yes, yeah, so um, I just, this is the, the whole thing, yeah. which is um, that we, shifted some of the thinking around, was it possible to make code changes that would make this easier to use? And so we've linked some of the ideas here. If people have ideas in this realm, you know, you can dive into the specific issues. These are really starting points that then the OPA team and anybody who wants to get involved can, you know, sort of add in ideas. And then I'll just round out by saying, talking about the CNCF recommendations similar to our last project in Toto, um, there are certain things that the project is not well positioned to do. And so if the CNCF wants to support this project more, having a study of user practices around this, um, you know, whether that people are catching common patterns and then also learning from the end user companies where there may be specific integrations that should be higher priority based on what people are doing with OPA that would be um, more impactful than maybe other things that they might do that we that we don't have visibility into, but the CNCF end user companies may. So that's. that's us. Yeah. So was it Brandon who asked that question? Uh, what the, I forgot. I didn't catch the name. So this is first time. Um, brought up about the discussions that happened, or the controversy. As uh, yes, uh, ask it, Dan okay. Daniel. Daniel, okay, okay. Oh, just first guy. But that might be uh, also an interesting thing to, um, I don't know, part of the reflection 
about, you know, what do we really learn? What was, um, you know, what were the things that were maybe unexpected by either the product team or us? Mm -hmm. I like that way of thinking about a uh, review of these security assessments. Yeah, yeah those are good inputs. Um, so we have seven more minutes. Uh, any thoughts, questions on uh, the process itself, the project? Uh, and again, I think the reason uh, reason for bringing this up in this forum is uh, the PR is open, uh, and I'll be I'll be doing a review of that. But anybody who wants to chime in and add any comments on that that needs to be considered, then uh, it will be very helpful. If not, I'd like to give a couple of minutes to Michael Ducey, who joined uh, joined later in the meeting, uh, to do a check-in. Sorry, JJ, I missed what you said. Yeah, it's yours, Michael. Do you want to give an update? Yes, uh, on the SIG security day. Sorry, I missed the first part of what you said. Yeah, this is. Uh, I just want to give you a couple of minutes to give a check in and an update. Uh, I, Emily Fox gave an update on uh, Six Security Day. Uh, at least touched upon it. So if you want to uh, give a little bit more detail on that, uh, that'll be good. Yeah, sure. Sorry. <clears throat> um, so as Emily probably already said, the schedule is out there and published. Um, we've had extremely good response from sponsorships. Uh, which has been extremely positive, and that means that we're able to provide things like lunch for attendees. Um, I, Amy, have we gotten an update on registrations? We have not. Okay. Last I know, it was a, around 81. Mm -hmm. um, and so now that we have a schedule out, we feel like we'll be able to push even more on registrations. Uh, I think we were thinking about 150 capping it somewhere around then. Um, that's kind of the next thing we need to start figuring out is how much room we have and then what we can effectively do uh, with the space that we have. Uh, so that's probably the next priority that we're going to be working on on our weekly calls. Outside of SIG security, um, the Falco project, we're coming up for our yearly review. Uh, and we're getting ready for that, which is going to be on October 15th. Uh, I believe that's correct, Amy. Is that right? Sorry, coming off mute. Yeah, that's correct. Yes. Um, so we're excited for that. We've made lots of good progress. Uh, we're shipping some very cool, interesting features, one of which is uh, we're actually probably merging some of this code in uh, today around gRPC-based outputs. Uh, so this has kind of been one of our sticking points is that a lot of our outputs and alerts have been um, kind of done in a more synchronous fashion. And with gRPC, it allows us to kind of offload the alerting engine uh, from the main Falco engine. <clears throat> and then we can have subscribers that are written in whatever language uh, people prefer. And then those subscribers can then forward the events and alerts into uh, what, whatever system like Elasticsearch or Kafka or, or whatever it might be. <clears throat> but having this kind of gR gRPC-based streaming service uh, is going to be really beneficial to the project. Um, I was running some numbers uh, just around like uh, how we've been performing sandbox uh, in the sandbox versus pre sandbox. And one of the interesting metrics I saw was before sandbox, we had about 34 daily active users in our Slack channel. After sandbox, we have about 104 daily active users um, in the Slack ch ch channel. Uh, and then a, a weekly active user perspective, it went from like 60 to 200. Uh, so the community is really thriving. We've got a lot of activity. We've got a lot of stuff going on. Uh, so we're really excited about how we can kind of see the CNCF engine really helping us out and benefiting the product overall. Any other questions I can answer? Anyone else? So on that note, I think, uh... Uh, Chris Nova is scheduled to have a demo of Falco next week.
so it may be worthwhile for you to coordinate with uh, with her to add any of these stats to the demo demo yeah, slash presentation for, sure. for next week. Yeah. yeah, and we wanted to push it off to next week because we wanted to have the GRPC code kind of a little bit more finalized so we could actually perfect. show that off to uh, the members of Six Security. Perfect, perfect, okay. Cool. Um, I think we are right about time. Any Anybody else has anything that they want to bring up in the next two minutes? If not, it's a wrap. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, JJ. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Well. Bye.